wherever you are, welcome to the British Interplanetary Society's seventh live streaming Q&A. Yes, it's only number seven. It seems as if we've been in lockdown for a lifetime. I hope we have a trouble-free session tonight. I'm sorry about the 40-minute delay we had last time. I'm afraid we couldn't get Michael on Skype, and it took some time for Michael to join, or for us to join Michael on Zoom. And then we had to connect it to YouTube. So sorry about that. We don't think it's going to happen tonight, but you never know. Um, right. Well, we are still learning the tricks of this trade, um, but let's hope Alan Marlowe has it all under control this time. For those who don't know me, I'm Alistair Scott, a past president of the Society, but I now just try to coordinate the events program, an interesting and challenging task at this time. I think there's, uh, there's more going on and we're hoping to get the rest of the program done through Christmas and then see what the new year brings. If at any time your YouTube link fails, I understand that you should just click on the same URL or link and rejoin the session at a more or less the same point. I hope you have all had the chance to watch John's fascinating talk on ever-decreasing circles or, as he says, an introduction to mission orbits. Though I spent my last 25 years working with and promoting satellites, mostly huge communication satellites at geostationary orbit, the easy bit, I never got to grips with orbital dynamics. I left that to the experts. As you will no doubt know, John is an astronomer at the UK Astronomy Technology Center in Edinburgh. So he knows everything about what's going on up there. I have to say he also worked on aircraft at BAE Walton. Was it Eurostar you were on, John? No, I was Tornado Air Defense variant, the fighter, ah. which is a multi-role combat aircraft. Right. Oh, so it was even before Eurofighter. Yeah, the uh, the uh, prototype, the experimental aircraft program, which became Eurofighter, was just starting when I was just leaving. Right. Okay. Well, so like me, he knows a bit about aircraft. I started as an aerodynamicist on the Airbus wings, but that was way back in 1967-68. <laughs> anyway, I'm pleased to have him with us tonight to answer your questions. We already have a number of questions, but if you have any more, please email them to me as soon as possible on streaming at bis-space.com. So I'll now hand over to, uh, to John and uh, I'll look out the questions. So over to you, John. Right. Hello, Alistair. Hello, everyone. Um, apologies for the purple background. I thought it was better than looking at my bookcase in the general shambles, which is my spare room, uh, which is where I'm, I am right now. The uh, Royal Observatory Edinburgh, where the UK ATC is based, has been closed because of the COVID-19 business. And although we're getting back uh, to something approaching normal, most of us are still uh, working from home. If you don't have to go into the office to physically do things like turn screwdrivers, uh, we're still being encouraged to stay at home. So I've been doing most of my work uh, remotely for the last few months. Uh, I'm a project scientist at the uh, Royal Observatory. And my current job is coordinating a large European Union astronomy program called Opticon, which is an attempt uh, to bring together the disparate uh, aspects of European astronomy, which all developed over the years uh, with their own national interests into a more coordinated uh, program. So that's, uh, I've been doing that for quite a while now and that's uh, that's still going on right now. In fact, that's what I've been doing today before I broke off to join this chat. My uh, astronomy is mostly solar system objects. I grew up with the uh, Apollo program. I was 15 when uh, Apollo 11 landed on the moon. Um, I mostly study, uh, so I want to be an astronaut. That's why I worked for British Aerospace because that's what astronauts did in those days. They were test pilots. Um, my plan was to be a uh, payload specialist on the space shuttle, but that uh, didn't work out in the end. Um, space shuttle missions became far fewer than we thought, and ESA didn't recruit British astronauts until I was too already too old to apply. Um, my, astron my astronomy is mostly solar system objects, comets and asteroids, uh, because if I can't land on it and it can't land on me, I don't really care. Um, so I'm, I'm not I'm not all that interested in uh, in black holes and galaxies at the edge of the universe. I'm strictly a uh, solar system person. 
Um, so I talked about satellite orbits a bit because I've worked on a number of, of missions. I worked on IRAS originally. I helped to make ROSAT and then I helped on uh, ISO. Uh, and although I'm not involved in the James Webb Space Telescope, but the Royal Observatory Edinburgh UK ATC has a, has a major role in, in James Webb. So that's me. Um, I did say at the beginning of my talk, I'm a user of satellites, not a builder of satellites or not a designer of satellites. So some of the questions may come out of left field a bit, but I'll do my best uh, to answer them. Well, thank you very much, John. We'll be able to discuss them at least. Um, right. Well, the first question, if you're ready for it, is from like Mike Lawford, who is actually in Harpenden, or as he says, near the Hertfordshire Bedfordshire border. He says, what is the actual process by which a final orbit is calculated and agreed for a satellite? I.e., from a calculation point of view, is there a computer program that you can input all the variables and then run scenarios to fine tune it? Yes, and yes, yes there are. I'll ask the second yeah, part later. Bit, okay, I'll, I'll let you go through that one. So yes, there are. I mean, these things have been developed over the years. And uh, as I mentioned in my talk, there's an excellent uh, free, freely accessible program from a company called Analytical Graphics. It's called the SDK, the Satellite Toolkit. Uh, you can get a test version for free, a test license for free, run it on a laptop. Um, and that allows you to uh, play around with uh, you know, picking an orbit and, uh, for, for example, for an uh, Earth observation satellite, modifying the height and, and uh, the inclination and stuff and getting the ground traces. Um, they even run online seminars uh, to help you learn how to use it. And then if you feel you need to use it professionally, then obviously you have to buy a license. But there is a free version uh, of that, which is, or at least was when I downloaded it, because I downloaded it for free and it runs on my company laptop. Uh, so, yeah, that's that's relatively easy, I think. Good. Well, the second part of the question then is from an agreement perspective, are these then put to an authority that agrees that you can put it into that specific orbit? Well, now that is an interesting question. Um, and uh, Alice and I were talking about this. Now, I'm not aware of there being, as, as it were, an air traffic control system for satellite orbits. Uh, the one area where I know there is a, a lot of international, um, there has to be a lot of international agreement is communication satellites, which is the uh, ITU, the International Telecommunications Union, because obviously with communication satellites, first of all, many of them want to be in the geostationary Clark orbit because they're all broadcasting direct broadcast satellites downwards. And they're all, there's only a limited spectrum of frequencies which you can use. Some of them are protected against radio use because they're used by astronomers but you know the electromagnetic spectrum the radio spectrum is divided up between all sorts of things military air traffic control radar communications emergency services and so on so there's a lot of negotiation that has to go on about which satellites and which companies can use which frequencies and and in which bit of space so the itu is the main one that i'm aware of like i say i'm not aware of there being anybody who says you know you have to bid for a slot to put your astronomy satellite at 600 kilometers and inclination of 98.2. I mean, if there is, I just don't know about it. Well, we may have someone in the audience that can give us that answer. In fact, I think NASA has quite a lot to say about where people go, but I'm not sure there's a coordinated uh, organization for it. Um, so the final part of his question is, and how long do these steps take? Well, a couple of years, I would think. I mean, the, the process of, of design, I mean, obviously, I think in terms of astronomy satellites, and I'm not a user, I'm a user, I'm not a really a designer. But I mean, the typical lifetime of an astronomy mission is something like 10 years from, hey, wouldn't it be a good idea if we did this, to actually getting the thing up and working? Um, and you can do a lot of these steps at the same time, of course. You, you come up to conceptual design about how big the telescope needs to be, how big the rocket needs to be to launch it. Um, you, can, you can start playing with orbits and maybe modify them. As I explained in the talk, the American CERTEF, which became Spitzer, uh, it's that its orbit evolved drastically over its lifetime. Uh, I mean, not just tweaked by a few a few percent here and there, but it went from shuttle attached to free flyer 
to eccentric orbit to trailing orbit. So it was completely redesigned every five years for 20 years. Um, I mean, people grew old working on CERTA. Uh, some of the original science team, you know, started it when they were quite young people and were really quite senior and quite old by the time they got there. Um, yeah, right. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, right, question two is actually from Alan Marlowe himself, based in Mil Milton Keynes. And he asks, why is it more energy efficient for visiting spacecraft to rendezvous with the ISS after a number of orbits rather than simply on the first orbit? I think the shuttle used to take two to three days to reach the Mir, then later the ISS. And until a few years ago, Soyuz always used to spend two to three days chasing Mir, then later the, I the ISS. Yeah, and that is a good question. And I'm afraid I simply don't know the answer. Um, I was quite taken aback when a few years ago there was a big brouhaha because the Russian, the Soviet, yeah, the Russians had had clipped the Soyuz rendezvous time down from two days to six hours because NASA were doing single orbit rendezvous in the Gemini program in the 1960s, yeah. uh, and the uh, Apollo astronauts when they blasted off from the moon they didn't spend two days rendezvousing with the uh, command module they were up off the moon and docked within about four hours so single orbit rendezvous or, or, or two orbit rendezvous are not you know they're not uncommon or they weren't uncommon uh, I, of course in the case of the space station uh, you've got the, the inclination of the uh, orbit is not doesn't match either Cape Canaveral or Baikonur uh, and because the orbit precesses, it's only going to fly directly overhead uh, once or twice a month or even a few times a year. So you have to kind of dog leg to get to it. And so I suspect this is about uh, fuel efficiency. Um, trying to do it, unless it was passing directly overhead, uh, which is only happens, it's only going to happen very rarely. Uh, I, I think it's just a question of... Uh, doing it gradually so as you don't burn too much fuel and overshoot and then have to waste more fuel correcting, something like that. But like I say, I'm not really an orbital dynamicist. Right, well, thank you very much. I think we'll have to see if there's an expert that can tell us uh, what's the reason for that. Um, now, Alan Marlow has asked another question and he says, is it true to say that it's actually more difficult to get into orbit around planets closer to the sun i.e. Mercury and Venus, than it is to get into orbit around Mars or Jupiter. I think the problem here, if, you, if you're trying to get into orbit around Jupiter, around Mars or Venus, an interior planet, is that uh, you, have to lose, you have to lose energy to fall down towards the sun. And it's, the sun is a very powerful gravitational field. And so you're going to get accelerated quite a lot. And what's going to happen is, if you're not careful, you're going to arrive at your target planet uh, going really very very quickly and then you have to burn a lot of fuel uh, just to slow down enough to be captured by the planet's orbit so if you look at the trajectory followed by pretty much everything that's been uh, into the inner solar system I mean even, even if we go back to 1973 with Mariner 10 which was a Mercury mission that made a Venus flyby to lose energy on its way to uh, Merc to get so it could drop in inwards towards Mercury and Things like Messenger, the Mercury orbiter that's just recently been decommissioned, and Bepi Colombo, which is the European uh, and Japanese mission to Mercury, which was launched last year or so. These take six or seven years to get to Mercury because they make multiple planetary flybys, multiple flybys of Venus first and then of Mercury itself, uh, just to lose some of that energy they've gained by rolling downhill towards the sun. All right, so we think we've got the answer there. Uh, great. Now, um, question four is from Les Shoulder, who says he's still on the East London Essex border. I don't think he's moved. And he asked the question, well, he first of all says, many thanks for a very interesting talk. As someone who has, no, uh, has had no background on the subject, it was very enlightening description of the difficulties in deciding on the pros and cons of the different orbits available to mission planets. Given the fact that space-based obser ob observatories built in the recent past seem in the main to long outlive their planned lifetimes and end their working lives having run out of consumables, 
is there any reason why the majority of missions could not all use the L2 orbit point with a, its extended mission observing and communication times and use any mass saved from the reduced shielding and coolants to carry more fuel for station keeping? Yeah, well, I think the answer to that is that uh, L2 is a long way away and you need a lot of energy to get there. Uh, and unless you really have a good reason for wanting to be an L2, the, uh, the cost of the rocket, it's the cost of the rocket that, uh, that makes you not want to go to L2 because the missions that have been flown to L2 have all used, uh, I think, I mean, mostly Ariane 5s, which is the biggest rocket Europe builds. Um, I bet E. Rosita was launched on a Proton, which is the biggest rocket that the, that the Russians have. Um, I can't remember what WMAP was launched by, but um, the cost of the rocket is often a major part of the space of this co total cost of the mission. So you really don't want to use a big rocket unless you really have to, because big rockets are really expensive. Um, and it might make it's 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 these trade offs. You know, there's a, there are always trade offs in this thing. I, I give another talk about. Uh, missions that have failed and you may remember some years ago that NASA had this mantra of faster cheaper better and the, and the problem was yeah we can do only two of those you know we can do faster and better but it won't be cheaper or we can do cheaper and faster but it won't be better so there's there's always lots of compromises in these things and uh, the cost of the launch vehicle is quite a big element in the cost of the mission so I think you have to compromise uh, and only go to L2 if you really have to. Uh, and the missions that have gone to L2 have all gone there for very specific reasons. James Webb, because it wants to be cold. Um, Gaia, because it needs to observe the sky in a very, from a very stable position. Uh, WMAP and, and uh, Planck, for the same reason, they have to be able to observe the whole sky. Hmm. Yes, I certainly had problems in uh, communication satellites, actually, because the the cost of the launch was, was about 30-40% um, of the total cost of the mission so it adds up right well we've got question five here which is actually again from les shoulder still on the east london essex border and he's saying going slightly off topic but into an area i am happier with with the success of space-based astronomy in the last 30 to 40 years what would you say were the most important new findings and or confirmations or otherwise, in other words, disproving of theories that had been long held and the ability to, of having an observ observatory in space has enabled? Yeah, well, uh, I mean, as an astronomer, I kind of, I would say this, but almost everything we've ever sent up has just, you know, reveal things we weren't expecting if you look at any, if you look at the history of any element of space astronomy x-ray astronomy is a good example there was a theoretical idea that the sun would emit x-rays and maybe one or two nearby stars so they shot up a couple of sounding rockets and they found a few things much brighter than they thought so they launched a small survey mission uhuru uh, things like that and that discovered dozens and dozens of x-ray sources and then they launched some X-ray telescopes, the high energy astrophysical observatories, uh, and then Einstein, which had an X-ray telescope. And that revealed whole, whole reams of astronomy that nobody had even thought of before. Then we had more powerful surveys like ROSAT, and then we have more powerful observatories like uh, XMM, uh, Newton, and uh, Chandra, the American equivalent. Now those missions have both been up for 10 years. They're both reaching the end of their natural life. And Europe is planning to launch yet another gigantic X-ray uh, space mission. And that story is true of anything else. Infrared, my subject, that's the same. A uh, few, few ground-based telescopes, the IRAS mission found lots of sources. We had ISO, uh, CERTEF eventually, then more detailed surveys, uh, then bigger telescopes like James Webb. Uh, and also we've, we've used, uh, we, we've picked out specific niches I mean, because all of the, the main windows, if you can call them that, have been opened. I mean, we've had X-ray surveys, we've had gamma ray surveys, we've had infrared surveys, but there are still lots of little niches. So there's the SWIFT satellite, which looks for gamma ray bursts um, and, and swings onto the target very, very rapidly. There was the X-ray timing explorer, which uh, didn't just survey the sky, but specifically measured things in the X-rays very, very 
quickly at a very, very high time resolution, and they all keep turning up new things. So, um, I mean, it is a bit of a cliche, but these satellites have just completely revolutionized astronomy. And if you don't believe me, go in the cupboard and find your golden age book of astronomy or your Patrick Moore's book of space from 1960. And just look how different a, a modern astronomy book is. You know, there's just whole reams of stuff we can do today, which we couldn't do before. And I wouldn't even begin um, to say which one was the most important. I guess if I had to pick one, uh, off the top of my head, I'd probably say the confirmation by Planck and WMAP that the cosmic microwave background is almost exactly matched to a 2.7k black body, which tells you for sure that the Big Bang theory works. And the the, the structure that you see in those all sky images in the in the in the microwave background, which are incredibly subtle. I mean, they look when you see them on a graph, they look like wallpaper. But we're talking millionths of a degree of difference in temperature here across the sky. So those things have completely revolutionised uh, our understanding of cosmology. And even though cosmology is not my subject at all, uh, I think if I was going to give a Nobel Prize for something, that probably be it. And indeed, that was indeed what they got Nobel Prizes for. The next one, that'll be the first Earth-like planet with a, a biomarker. Right. Well, thank you. That was excellent and um, very useful. Now, the, the, you've probably answered part of this question already because he says, is the James Webb telescope a game changer? Yeah, I think it is. Uh, I think it will be. Um, the... the uh, Infrared telescopes we've had in the past, like IRAS, ISO, um, and CERTEF, have all been less than a meter in diameter, uh, and the James Webb is six and a half meters, so that's that's thirty something times the collecting area, um, and of course the instrumentation on it is vastly more sophisticated than we had in previous generations of infrared uh, missions. So we have a a much more powerful telescope, and much more powerful instruments with a much longer lifetime. Um, so, yeah, it should. It should be able to uh, be an absolutely cracking mission, uh, doing everything from nearby stars and planetary systems to stuff at the very edge of the universe. I mean, it can do the solar system as well, but that's quite tricky because solar system objects move. And although the Webb telescope is designed to cope with moving targets, my guess is most of the time will be spent looking at uh, extrasolar planets and uh, distant cosmological targets. Mm. I was interested in your talk that you mentioned the fact that some satellites had gone for uh, protecting the coolers with uh, massive uh, uh, blankets and things. Um, is that what keeps uh, James Webb up and running or is there a limit on the length of time it will have in, in orbit? The, the rate limiting, the lifetime limiting thing on the web, assuming nothing actually fails, is station keeping fuel because the L2 orbit is not completely stable. So you have to you have to use about a half a meter per second of delta V. That's you know, for those of you who don't speak this language, that's you have to thrust your your rocket a little bit. Um, uh, and you need to you know you need to accelerate by about a half a meter per second per year um, just to keep it in the right place in space. And, and it's most likely that it'll be that fuel that runs out before mm. uh, anything. That's what will limit the lifetime. Yeah, it, it, there's no uh, there's no liquid coolant to boil no. away. OK, right. Um, the final question from Les is what type of observatory are we missing? What would you most like to see? Yeah, well, we've as I said, we've filled most of the uh, obvious windows. There are a few niches left, but the one window we haven't really closed yet or op sorry, op fully opened yet is gravitational wave astronomy. And we've seen a bit of this from the ground in the last few years with the LIGO uh, detectors, uh, these huge uh, laser beams bouncing up and down to tunnels in, uh, in the United States. Um, but there is a European mission called LISA, the, the Laser Interferometry in Space, uh, which is another gravitational wave experiment uh, where they will have two masses uh, many, many kilometers apart and they will bounce laser beams between them. And if there's a, a ripple, in the great in the space-time continuum the the satellites will drift apart and then drift back together again by very small distances 
but the laser beams are sufficiently accurate they will detect these little motions and so that will give us another gravitational wave window uh, you might think well can't we do it from the ground but the the uh, Lisa spir the the, 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 le the wavelengths of the, the vibrations that Lisa will detect are different from the vibrations which are detected by the ground-based gravitational wave detectors. Uh, so it probes a different mass range. And in fact, I guess I should get a plug in here. The uh, my my organisation or our organisation, the uh, STFC's UK Astronomy Technology Centre, uh, is involved in Lisa. We're just uh, right now commissioning a new laboratory in which we'll be doing some work for towards this LISA mission, which doesn't get, get launched for about another 10 years. Mm, right, that'll be a big program then. Yes, it's. Uh, we're talking to one of the guys. They're having a virtual window in the lab because they can't have a real window because it's got lasers bouncing around inside. But right. they do need big screens to reduce their show their data. And when they're not showing data, they're going to have it on a webcam, which will look out at where the window would be looking if there was only a window there. Right. I believe there are going to be three satellites and they're going to be 5,000 kilometers apart. I think that's that's the the, that the the ideal mission is to have three shape, yeah, shape like, like that. Yeah. So you, you, you measure this distance and this distance simultaneously. Yep. Triangulation. Um, right. I have a question in from Steve Salmon and he's currently in Rome. So enjoying the, uh, the life of the, uh, uh, the, the Romans. Right, and he's got two questions. Bonjour, no. One I think might be fairly easy for you. Is the IRAS satellite from 1983 still in orbit as orbital debris, or has it re entered Earth's atmosphere and burnt up? Yes, it is still in orbit. Uh, IRAS was in a 900 kilometer orbit, which is stable for about a thousand years. Uh, and in fact, uh, IRAS was in the news quite recently, but in the last six months, I think, <clears throat> because the, the BBC announced that someone had predicted a, a, a very near miss or a possible satellite collision. And I clicked on the link for the news story and up popped a picture of IRAS, which, if you remember, I said was my first ever job. Uh, and I thought, whoa, this is my satellite that they're talking about here. But in fact, uh, uh, the, the, the collision didn't occur, but the missed distance was estimated at less than 30 metres. So that's pretty close if you think how big some satellites are with their solar panels and stuff. So yeah, IRS is definitely still up there, but it's not operational any longer. Uh, after the helium ran out, uh, it was kind of put into hibernation and it was used occasionally for testing, you know, just the, the, the satellite control systems. It, it could still talk to the satellite, but it couldn't do astronomy once the helium ran out. Mm. Right, thank you. I think that's uh, an interesting one. And his question number two, is although with constellations of thousands of satellites such as Starlink now being launched, there seems to be a certain amount of redundancy built into how each constellation covers the Earth. Even if a few are rendered inoperative through onboard system failure or collisions with orbital debris, etc. But does this ever greater number of satellites only increase the threat of the runaway Kessler effect, eventually resulting in low Earth orbit being made unusable because of increasing clouds of space junk. Yeah, well, that is the risk. Um, I mean, we, when we, there is a lot of redundancy in these in these satellite constellations, but that's precisely because some of these things will fail. They're not very big, and they're not that. You know, they're, they're, they want to have re reliable communications over basically the whole of the Earth. And if you've got a big building or a mountain in the way, you need to be able to pick up another satellite. Because those of you who have got, you know, if you're all of those who remember modems, how frustrating it was when you get halfway through a download and the uh, and the signal dropped out and you had to start again. Um, but yeah, the, uh, the, the space debris thing is something which has come up in the last couple of decades, I think, because in the first first half century of the space age, the space was a big place and we didn't put that much stuff up there. And then more and more um, awareness has come that we can't just keep forever launching more and more bits and pieces. Um, as Alistair will know, the geostationary ring is already protected. There is a, a an agreement that if your satellite's in the geostationary ring and it becomes obsolete, you're, you're expected to keep 5% or something of your propellant left just to just enough to move it away once you finish with it uh, so as not to clutter up that bit of space 
Uh, and yeah, the more stuff we put into low Earth orbit, the more of a problem it's going to be, which is why various things are in train to investigate CubeSats, because CubeSats are another thing. They're very cheap. They're very easy to launch. So lots of CubeSats are being investigated if they can pop out a little sail or something to increase the atmospheric drag to make them re-enter more quickly rather than uh, cluttering up space. Right. Well, I'm just looking for the next question, which it appears that this is one... Right, this is from Patrick Mann, and he says, thank you for organizing yet another excellent live stream event tonight. I've watched Dr. David's excellent video, found it totally enthralling. If possible, I'd be grateful if the following question could be put to you. Uh, thank you for a fascinating talk on spacecraft mission orbits. I'd be very interested to hear a little more about the process that mission designer goes through when deciding on a particular orbit for a proposed mission. Oversimplifying horribly, is it something like picking a meal from a menu where you look at a table of information, such as the one that appears near the end of your, uh, of your talk, listing the pros and cons of different orbits, and you pick the one that meets all the essential requirements of your mission, plus as many of the desirable requirements as possible? Uh, yeah, it's an, it's an iterative process, and it's the same thing we go through when we're building um, experiments on the ground for big telescopes. Uh, I'm an astronomer. I want something which will do everything, cost nothing, and be ready tomorrow. Um, the engineers will say, yeah, I can do that, but it'll take you, it'll take 50 years, it'll cost 100 million pounds. Um, what you know so then we and they have a little chat well well how about if we do this or could you get by with just about that so the same sort of thing will go on uh, when people are designing satellites uh, the the astronomers will want the biggest possible telescope they can have and then the engineers will say well you can't have one that big because it'll be too heavy so how about if it's this big oh yeah okay well that'll do but can we get some performance back by putting it a bit higher or a bit lower yeah we can but then that'll cost you something else in terms of communications time or in terms of pointing time at your target. So there is this um, uh, constant interaction. It's a bit like planning a family holiday. I want to go somewhere where there's an air museum. My wife wants to go somewhere where there's a castle. The kids want to go somewhere where there's a playground. Uh, and we have to find somewhere that's kind of near a castle and not too far from an air museum and has a playground nearby. And, uh, you know, that's the sort of process we would, the, the, you go through when designing anything whether it's a plane or, or a or a, a town uh, or a satellite mission so it's all about compromises uh, what can we afford what can we technically do what's the risk because sometimes you might have a really brilliant idea that if it works will be absolutely red hot but it's never been done before uh, and if it goes up and doesn't work then you've blown your whole mission in the first five minutes uh, so there's, there's a lot of a lot of these trade-offs have to go on uh, and it's not, you know, it's not a, just open the book and, yeah, we'll have one of those, please. Uh, you know, the people spend hours, years arguing about this sort of thing. And quite often, the ground rules change. So, for example, uh, my job in Birmingham, I was working on the uh, ultraviolet camera, which formed part of the ROSAT mission. And ROSAT was going to be launched by the space shuttle. Uh, and while I was there, the Challenger accident occurred and the space shuttle was grounded and ROSAT had to be completely redesigned um, to be launched on a, on a rocket rather than a space shuttle. So quite often you can be quite a long way through this process when the goalposts move and, and you have to start again. Yes, we had to do the same with a couple of our satellites, complete redesign to launch on another launch vehicle. So um, I know the problem. Um, and those were just communication satellites. Uh, now, he finishes off by saying, or is each mission orbit pretty much a unique design exercise where you start from scratch and design the orbit to fit the specific characteristics of the mission? And if the latter, do the constraints on mission orbits sometimes feed back into the design of the spacecraft itself with compromises or different choices having to be made to accommodate the practical realities of the best orbit that can be achieved? I think yeah, you've answered think, some yeah, of that, yeah, but think, I'll let you have another go. Yeah, I think that was pretty much uh, exactly. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't see the second half of the question, but yeah, it, it's a huge mess of compromises. Uh, 
and there's no there's no right answer i mean there never is a right answer um, it's the same as i say when we build our ground-based telescope instruments uh, we, we we'd like you to do everything and we just it's just not realistic to do everything so and, and anything you change will have knock-on effects somewhere else in the system so quite often you go through many design iterations uh, before you finish up with something that's that's finally gets launched if again if you look at artists impressions of lots of famous spaceships you'll find the original concepts didn't look much like the things that finished up being launched the lunar module you know it originally had five legs and seats and a helicopter like cabin with lots of glass and they finished up standing up attached to seat belts with two tiny windows uh, because of the compromise that they had to make to make it all work yep Right. Well, thank you for that. Um, we've got a question in now from uh, Edward Zigoy, and he's in Portland, Oregon. And so that's in the USA, as people know. Um, if L2 is favorable for space astronomy, what issues would arise of an astronomical telescope situated at an L5 colony? Um, well, there's no reason why you wouldn't you couldn't put a telescope if you did build a, a space colony at L5. Um, I'm not sure it would give you a huge amount of a, advantage over something in a high Earth orbit, though, because you're still you, you've got the advantages of not having Earth light, and I guess you could, but you and you've got the sun on one side, but you've got the um, and I guess to the Earth's fixed as well, but they're not all in the same direction. Um, so. I mean, I think I'd ask the question: Why, why unless you, had, why would you go to L5 when you could go to L2? Because L2 is ideal for lots of other things. Of course, it, again, it, it might be a compromise thing that if there's already a space station at L5, you might want to take advantage of the on-site maintenance and stuff, which you can't do at L2 because it's too far away. Um, as to the best of my knowledge, no one's ever proposed putting a space telescope at L5. Um, now, just my quick question: Does does L two get a bit crowded then? Well, no, it's um, it's a big it's a, the most of these satellites they're not actually out of the L two point. They're in no. these so called lucidity orbits, uh, which go around L two. And uh, in any case, there's only six or seven missions there right now. And as I said, they have to constantly station keep. So once the mission fails or dies, um, even if you don't actively move it away. Um, in a year, within a few years, just gravitational perturbations and the fact you're not correcting for them will drift your dead satellites well away from the uh, region. But the, the James Webb Telescope is in a an orbit around L2, which is thousands of kilometers. I forget how many, but it's many thousands of kilometers. So the chance of bumping into another uh, spacecraft in L2 is vanishingly small. Right, so no orbital debris out there then? Not at the moment. No, it's not a problem for the moment. And remember, it's because it's not a stable state. Even if you did have some debris there, it would tend to drift away unless you actively keep pushing it back. Mm. Yeah. Now, I've got a question just in from Ange and Nigel in West London. Um, hi, all. Uh, what's the optimal number of satellites in each orbit, LEO, MEO and GSO? or GEO as we'd call it, and how many would be too many to handle or control in these orbits? Then if it's not got too full, who decides who can place a satellite or not? Yeah, well, that's almost where we came in, isn't it? That was the very, almost the first question we got asked. Um, I know that the, the geostationary ring is, I mean, it's not full, full, but it's getting pretty crowded because communication satellites i mean they don't they're not sending laser beams down to earth they're sending out relatively broad beams and and there's some danger they will start to overlap with the satellite next door um, i don't have a number in my head about how many satellites you could put in low earth orbit i mean it would be thousands i would guess um, we know that starlink and, and OneWeb are talking about putting up thousands of satellites in these orbits and that's just one company or two companies each with thousands of satellites each um, so I don't think there's a, a kind of magic number when that orbit, that region of space gets full. Um, mm, well, certainly geostationary orbit uh, gets full because they, they've now moved them to, well, when I first started, they were one degree of orbit. 
but they're now down to half a degree of orbit and they're stacking five or six satellites on each or half degree of orbit. So it is getting a bit crowded out there. Yeah, but the geostationary rings, I mean, that's it's got to be very much in the plane and it's got to be at exactly the right distance. So you don't have much degree of freedom there. You've got and to they've even had to extend the graveyard orbit out to something like 250 kilometers when it was used to be 150. Uh, right, I've got another question just come in. Alex Wood, typically coming in at the last minute with the most awkward of questions. So Alex Wood actually asked the question, you mentioned a stretched GTO orbit that gives 20 hours of communications with the ground station. Yeah. Why not go a bit further and use a geostationary orbit instead, giving continuous communications? Uh, because the, 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 uh, the orbit we're talking about here is the thing that was used by ISO. Um, and it's not just about communications with the ground station. It's the ability to point at the same time. It's the ability to point uh, at some astronomical target. And if you're in geostationary orbit, uh, as the Earth turns, you'll go around the backside of the Earth, and and so you'll lose sight of your uh, astronomical target. There's been no astronomy missions in geostationary orbit. Um, there's one scientific mission, there have been one or two scientific missions, but I think they were particles and physics type experiments, but no one's ever put an astronomy mission into a geostationary orbit. Uh, it's back to that compromises thing. Um, the continuous ground station coverage will be great, but you'll lose something else. And the something else is probably more important in this case. It's probably better to build two or three ground stations and have full use of your satellite rather than skimping on ground station and uh, losing some of your observing time. Mm. Yes, I think geo would mean you'd have to keep turning the satellite around as the Earth rotated, yeah. so uh, you'd have equal uh, amount of fuel usage there. Well, it'd be like having a telescope on the Earth. I mean, the targets would rise and set. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Well, we've got some more questions coming in. Actually, okay. we've got one more here from Alex Wood. I mentioned that one. Um, you mentioned Starlink as mitigating their impact on astronomy. What are they doing? And what about other constellations? Right, well, I was at a, uh, I, was, I, was at a I was at, I was participating in a virtual conference session about uh, the imp implications of these satellite clusters on astronomy. And I was a speaker from the Starlink uh, organization. Um, and they uh, are doing things. They've started, one of the things they did in one of their most recent launch clusters, they had one satellite which was essentially painted black, or at least it had been, uh, it had been treated in such a way so that the, the Earth-facing side was not so reflective. Now, of course, that's not a complete solution because if you paint something black, it might not radiate, it might not shine very much, but it will get hot and it will radiate in the infrared. Uh, they also showed a design. These Starlink satellites are actually surprisingly flat. Um, you, you don't think of satellites as being flat, but these things are more or less flat. So they, they showed this example of a, of a Starlink satellite, which kind of had a, a fence up here, which was designed to reflect the sunlight away uh, so as to stop it reaching the satellite and then reflecting downwards. So those are the two things that they are, uh, that, they, that I know they're working on already, which is coverings which are less reflective and so less likely to bounce visible light back down at you and also trying to sh put mirrors or something on so the satellite just bounces the light from the sun back out into space rather than absorbing it and then re-radiate it in the infrared. Mm, thank you. There's a, there's a, I mean the Starling ones aren't actually the worst because they're relatively low and so they're only illuminated by the sun in twilight in the morning and evening twilights. So when the sky is really dark, the satellites don't see the sun anyway, so they don't reflect. It's the ones that are in higher orbits that are more likely to be a problem because if they're at a thousand kilometers, particularly in the summer, they're always going to be in sunlight. And so they're always going to be shining at you, even in the middle of the night. Mm. I'm surprised they didn't have to uh, get the ITU to discuss that with you astronomers, but um, well, that's, that's the um, next task. We all have our priorities, and um, I guess most people would sacrifice astronomy for vaster broadband. Uh, mm. I wouldn't, but, but perhaps some people would. 
No, I'll stick to cable. Good old wires. Uh, right, I have a, another question actually in from Steve Salmon. And he says, as the subject of space security and safety is something close to my heart, so to speak, I believe that the paths of most NEOs or near-Earth objects uh, or asteroids are observed using telescopes on Earth. Are there any orbital satellites specifically tasked with NEO path observation or monitoring? Um, yeah, there is actually, uh, although it's, it was not a mission that was launched for that purpose. I mean, this is a question very close to my heart because I said my first job was on IRAS. My first job on IRAS was actually to detect near-Earth near -Earth objects. Um, uh, now, a few years ago, the Americans launched a mission called WISE, the Wide Field Infrared Spectroscopic Explorer, and that was a, one of these missions which was cooled. Uh, and when the coolant ran out, it was no longer able to complete its primary mission. But uh, some of the detectors would still work in this relatively warm environment, and so the mission was, after being hibernated for a couple of years, it was brought out of hibernation um, and tasked with near-Earth object detection. And it was renamed NEOWISE uh, for that mission. And it was NEOWISE that discovered the comet, which was visible in the night sky two months ago. That's, what, uh, that's why it was called NEOWISE, because it was found by the NEOWISE satellite. Oh. So uh, nobody's launched a dedicated asteroid hunting satellite, but the WISE satellite was repurposed to do uh, near-Earth asteroid observation. Um, and the, the, the questioner is quite right. There are several telescopes on the ground which do regular searches. The uh, PANSTARS is one in Hawaii, uh, which does um, surveys the night sky regularly for near-Earth objects and other things. But some bits of the sky are very hard to see. Uh, you can't look, you can't point a telescope near the sun. You know, it's, 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 it's we have a technical term for this we call it daytime uh, and uh, so you know you can't observe particularly objects which are between the earth and the sun they're only visible in the sky in in the daytime or in the twilight and it's very hard to do regular astronomy uh, in in those conditions whereas if you're in space it's it's a bit better you still can't point straight at the sun but you haven't got uh, the twilight atmosphere in the way well, thank you. I think we've um, we've actually now run out of questions. If anyone's got any, please be quick because we're going to uh, close the session down in the next five or six minutes. Um, thank you very much, John, for excellent talk. And I, I actually really liked your presentation because the slides were so clear and uh, understandable, full of information. So thank you very much for that. Um, right. Well, we've we've also got to thank Alan. Marlowe for making this happen. He did the recording and also put it out on YouTube for us. And in fact, is coordinating things now. Um, I'll, I'll have a beer later. But what I'd like to do, first of all, is just say thank you for joining us tonight. We actually have, and just today, I've managed to discuss the next uh, presentation and talk. And it's going to be by Dawn Aerospace who are based, based in both the Netherlands and in uh, New Zealand. And their Q&A their is going to be on the 28th of October, and we're hoping that their presentation will be available from about the 21st or 22nd of October. Um, I think it's going to be on their new space plane, but I'm leaving that up to them. I will find out more about it and make sure all the information is put out on the website. And I'm hoping also to squeeze in another talk, if I can get it sorted, uh, in World Space Week, which is from the 4th to the 10th of October, as you all know. And we're trying to put something on for the 7th of October, and that I will find out in the next couple of days. So I'll be uh, hoping to put that out as an email to you all, but otherwise keep watching the website. And thank you very much for joining us tonight, and thank you John for, for joining us and for explaining so much about the orbits that we now use. And good night to you all. Thank you. Cheers.